This is lesson three in this series on pulmonary function tests, and the topic is measuring lung volumes. The learning objectives are to gain a basic understanding of the four primary methods for measuring the functional residual capacity and thus total lung capacity, and to be able to use the total lung capacity to diagnose restrictive lung disease. This chart is probably starting to look pretty familiar. In the last video on spirometry, I discussed the vital capacity, which is the sum of the tidal volume and the inspiratory and expiratory reserve volumes. However, there is one volume that spirometry cannot measure, the residual volume, that is, the amount of air left in the lungs when the person has exhaled as completely as possible. With an inability to measure residual volume using just spirometry, we are left with an inability to measure the functional residual capacity or total lung capacity the latter of which is particularly helpful in PFT interpretation. Therefore, I must introduce some additional PFT methods. There are four methods that can be used to measure these remaining lung volumes and capacities. They are helium dilution, nitrogen washout, body plethysmography, and the use of chest x-rays or CT to extrapolate volumes from radiographic measurements. The first two items on this list use a very similar principle and are collectively referred to as gas dilution techniques. Let me briefly review how each works. In the helium dilution technique, we start with a reservoir, which is attached to a device which can measure the concentration of helium contained within, as well as a three-way stopcock and a mouthpiece. The source of helium is attached and the reservoir is filled to some predetermined concentration of helium. The patient then puts his mouth around the mouthpiece, first breathing in outside air with normal tidal volumes. Then when the patient is at a normal end expiration, that is when the lungs are at the functional residual capacity, the technician turns the stopcock and the patient begins to breathe it the helium air mixture. With each breath, helium moves out of the reservoir and into the lungs until an equilibrium is reached and the helium concentration in the reservoir levels off. Since we are dealing with a closed system, and since helium is not absorbed across the alveolar capillary membrane, the initial amount of helium at the beginning must equal the final amount of helium at the end. The initial amount is equal to the initial concentration of helium times the volume of the reservoir, including the connecting tubing. The final amount is equal to the final concentration times the total volume over which the helium is distributed, which is the volume of the reservoir plus the functional residual capacity, assuming that the final concentration is measured with the patient at his or her FRC. And solving the equation for FRC? Advantages of the helium dilution technique are that it is simple and relatively inexpensive to perform. The major disadvantage is that it only measures the volume within the chest that communicates with the upper airways. In other words, it does not measure the volume of gas trapped in lung bullae. Next is nitrogen washout. In this technique, the patient breathes through a mouthpiece that has two one-way valves. One valve connects to a source of 100% oxygen. The other connects to a device which records both the volume of gas exhaled as well as the nitrogen concentration over many breaths. The patient starts at their functional residual capacity breathes in 100% oxygen, and exhales out the nitrogen-containing gas initially left within their lungs into the device. Not all of the nitrogen within the lungs will get expelled with each breath, but with the patient taking successive breaths in and out, over the course of several minutes, the nitrogen level in the exhaled gas will asymptotically approach zero. Using standard test methodology, the test is considered over once the nitrogen concentration is below 1.5% for three successive breaths. Similar to helium dilution, the initial amount of nitrogen in the lungs must equal the total amount of nitrogen exhaled. Thus, the FRC is equal to the total volume exhaled over all of the breaths during the test times the average concentration of the nitrogen in the exhaled gas divided by the estimated initial concentration of nitrogen within the alveoli. Nitrogen washout has the same general advantages and disadvantages as helium dilution, with the one added disadvantage 
of possibly potentiating carbon dioxide retention in patients with severe COPD due to the 100% oxygen's effect on overcoming pulmonary hypoxic vasoconstriction, thus worsening VQ mismatch. Body plethysmography works on a completely different principle. It starts with a clear plastic or glass box the size of a phone booth. There is a mouthpiece inside and a tube to the outside air. Attached to this tube, outside of the box, is a stopcock or other type of closable valve. Then there are pressure transducers which record the pressure within the air inflow tube and within the box itself. The patient sits inside the box, quickly panting with the airway open, when it's suddenly shut while the patient continues to pant. This creates oscillations in the airway and box pressures. The key physical principle used in plethysmography is Boyle's Law, which states that the product of pressure and volume is a constant for a closed system. Starting with this law and applying some scenario-specific algebra and physics, one ends up with an equation that looks something like this, where TGV stands for thoracic gas volume and is used to determine total lung capacity. Unless you're a PFT lab technician, the details of what these variables stand for, as well as the details of the skipped over steps here, will not be necessary to know for any routine clinical application. While the primary advantage of plethysmography is that it is generally considered to be the most accurate method for determining lung volume, it is also the most expensive by a sizable margin as a result of the box and its assorted peripheral equipment. The final method for measuring lung volumes are radiographic techniques. From a patient's chest x-ray, measurements of the lungs in the PA and lateral views can be taken and entered into an algorithm to estimate lung volume. From a chest CT, the cross-sectional area of the lungs in each axial slice is multiplied by the thickness of the slice, and all of them are then added together for the lung volume. Both of these are easier to perform for the patient, but less accurate. The patient will still need to be able to perform an adequate breath hold and generally follow directions regarding his or her breathing pattern during the test. So what do we now do with this information about the lung volumes, specifically the total lung capacity? Well, here's a very brief summary of how spirometry and lung volumes can be used together to make a diagnosis in a patient with lung disease. A patient with low FEV1 to FVC ratio has obstructive lung disease, which is what we talked about in the last video. A patient with low total lung capacity, or TLC, has a restrictive lung disease. And a patient unfortunate enough to have both a low FEV1 to FVC ratio and a low TLC has both obstructive and restrictive lung disease, often referred to as a mixed defect. Here is how the four individual lung volumes break down for some categories of lung disease. For comparison, here's a normal patient's volumes with the vital capacity, or FVC, and the TLC. In typical obstructive lung disease, the residual volume is greatly increased, while the other volumes remain about the same. Therefore, the vital capacity is also about normal, while the total lung capacity is often increased. In restrictive lung disease, all of the lung volumes are reduced, resulting in both a reduction in vital capacity and TLC. Last, there is this potentially confusing scenario in which the residual volume is so increased above normal that it more or less crowds out the other lung volumes. Therefore, the vital capacity is reduced compared to normal, even as the total lung capacity is increased compared to normal. This pattern is known as pseudo-restriction because it will appear to be indicative of restrictive lung disease if only the lung volumes from spirometry are measured and examined. To make an accurate diagnosis in this case that the patient actually has severe obstructive disease, one would need the complete lung volumes measured. While the flow volume loop from conventional spirometry can demonstrate severe coving of the expiratory limb and thus obstruction, it may be impossible to differentiate the pseudo-restriction variant of obstruction from a mixed obstruction and restriction defect.
I'm going to end by returning to this diagnostic algorithm from the last video. You may remember that I pointed out a good degree of uncertainty which remained using this in its current form. So how can we eliminate some of that uncertainty using our knowledge of lung volumes? First is this category of obstruction versus mixed disorder for patients with a low FEV1 to FVC ratio and a low FVC. If we also examine the TLC, this uncertainty can be resolved. If the TLC is normal or high, the patient has obstruction, specifically the pseudo-restriction variant of obstruction, whereas if the patient has a low TLC, he or she has a mixed defect. The other major point of uncertainty was here, with a normal or high FVV1 to FVC ratio combined with a low FVC being indicative of, quote, possible restriction. Once again, let's first check the lung volumes before drawing any conclusions. If TLC is low, restriction is confirmed, while if TLC is normal or high, which is the rarest constellation of PFT findings, there are various possible explanations. That ends this video on lung volumes. The next video in this series will discuss the DLCO.